Next thing you know, he's racked it out and he's trying to cut my face on my throat. Life to me now has changed. I'm not the man I was when I joined. A police interceptor to one of the most recognised policemen in the country. I was a traffic cop for 19 years in my shots, please. I joined in 2001. It were a different time then. Do you remember the first moment that made you realise that everything was very real? I were on patrol. He's no bigger than me and he's no stronger than me. And then I can see a glint in the corner of my eye. I can see something shiny. ACR starts showing up for all units, all units. Ben's under massive attack here. I've done things that no one else ever do. There's only so much a human being can see. And that's what broke me. Lost it all. Just did that, that, that switch, just lost everything, just became half the man I was, and I am half the man I am now. That's really profound. you got to understand as well, part of me and this is I just start crying. So please bear with me if I do. Finally, because we've had to rearrange this about two to three times, I reckon. Last time was because you thought there was going to be six foot snow waves covering the car park. They were by us. Oh, was there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were in the village snowed in, so yeah, I do apologise. But Ben, finally, welcome to the podcast. And no doubt there will be people watching whose first thoughts were, hey, it's that bloke off Channel 5, fleece interceptors. However, um, life is clearly for someone looking in and following what you do, very different to what it used to be. And Ben, in your own words, who are you now and what do you do? And who were you and what did you do? Uh, yes, sir, I'm Ben Pearson. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It means a lot. So who am I now? Um, <clears throat> I'd like to say I'm a mental health advocate, but I don't really like using the word advocate too much. Um, but I talk about mental health a lot to members of the public. I do a bit of YouTube and I do a bit of podcasting. I'm a best-selling author and just all around cheeky guy, really. And what did I do before? I drove a fast car for West Yorkshire Police. I was a traffic cop uh, for 19 years in West Yorkshire Police and I was a Channel 5 Police Interceptor for three series as well. So life to me now has changed completely differently on another path. Um, I'm not the man I was when I joined. Um, I'm not the man I was 20 years ago. And that's due to mental health issues. Uh, it's gone deep really quickly, I think. <laughs> Right, um, hang on, I haven't even started my <laughs> cup of tea yet. There's still steam coming off of that. Hang on, let me get um, in the zone. But yeah, uh, I'm I'm on like a path now that I love and I wouldn't change for anything. And it's amazing how you've put that path together through different passions of yours and things that you really care about has actually formed a whole new career. And I definitely think that you underestimate some of the things that you've achieved in a relatively short period of time. You mentioned, oh, I do a bit of YouTube. Guys you getting over 100,000 views of video and... Isn't it on 90,000 subscribers? You're going to be getting that yeah, plaque Yeah, just 9,000 subscribers, yeah. You're a best-selling book on uh, everything that you can... Two best-selling <laughs> books on everything. Where are they then? Ben, uh, ben Collins brought his book to Yeah, flog. sorry, I, I got up early this morning. I've completely forgot. I do apologise. Um, they're on my website, so I'm not plugging that, but yeah. But let's explain, take it right back, because we live in a world currently where if we just look at kind of the crime space in general... Everything just seems to be right, if you look at it from the outsider's point of view. Knife crime is horrendous. Can't even wear a nice watch into London anymore, somewhere that's supposed to be the UK's most prestigious city, um, without thinking that it's going to get stolen or it actually being stolen. Assaults, drugs, everything is, is crazy. Was it different thinking about becoming an officer and joining the force back when you did to what it is now? And what makes somebody want to do that? Yeah, um, I joined in 2001 and I'm not saying we're sheltered, but there weren't a lot of YouTube about, there weren't a lot of internet about, there were no social media things such as Facebook or uh, Twitter or anything, so no, nothing could be shared, so to speak, you had to go to the paper. So you didn't see as much then as what you do now, and I'm not saying we were naive or we're in, living in a completely different world or a different bubble, um, but yeah, it were a different time then. We always say, I, I was born in 1976 and I used to say, well, I used to be able to play out and no one ever scared of the white van man, so to speak, coming past. Uh, and now you've got to be aware of that. Um, but they were still there. It's just that we were a different time. Um, what makes me want to join? I've been a, a child at late 70s, early 80s, and I don't know if you remember, but there were programs like Chips, TG Hooker, A-Team, you're just checking your head out, yeah. Proper 80s cheesy TV. 
have, have you ever heard of A Team? Right. Okay. You're going to have to look at this when you get back. But they're a proper American series where they'd shoot guns at everyone. No one would ever get hit by a bullet. No one would ever die. Um, so there were chips on California Highway Patrol, uh, on the more bikes. There were Night Rider. Uh, yeah. So there were Night Rider. There were, there were A Team. There were everything like that. And it were pushed as an early age. And I loved it. I loved that as- aspect of it sounds cliche, it sounds cheesy, but going out and helping people. And everyone says, well, that's what every copper says. Well, it's not because that's what I wanted to do. And I found myself doing things um, before I were an officer. So just say, for instance, I was driving back from a friend's house and the shop in front of me blew up. It literally, like a film, just boosh, and it came across the road, there were fire, there were flames. Um, I got out of my car, I looked inside the shop and I could see someone and he was literally on fire or burning. So I went into the shop, pulled this gentleman out, uh, our, my hands were burned, uh, the leather jacket, I wore had cinders on it, my face, were, I had like, really tight skin. Um, I turned up it with a shopkeeper and he blew his own shop up for an insurance job. And then we were pulling him out and everyone was ringing 999 and this car skids up and he throws himself in it. He's got like this shirt that's like burnt to him because he was that badly injured. His hair had gone, his ear had gone and that sort of thing. So he was really badly injured and he'd done it himself for an insurance job. And it was at that moment in time I realised there's two lives. There's the life you live and then there's the life what you don't see that crawls round at three o'clock in the morning down these back alleyways. And no matter who people are, so when you've requested me to do this, I've really wanted to do it because I love you, what you do, I love your content. But people see a police officer from TV and they think this is it and this is how the police is. But what you don't see is the, the element that is kept away from you. You don't see the element that um, people work so hard so you can sleep well in your bed at night. And so this were a gentleman that was blowing his own shop up. And this were in, I think it was 1994 that this happened, 1995, when this happened. And I've just been massively intrigued by it ever since. And then I uh, moved to Spain, came back and sold motorbikes at a motorcycle dealership for BMW. So, so, I, you just suddenly decided, I'm going to move to Spain. I'm just going to move to Spain. Just okay. going to throw it all out there, move to Spain and come back. And I just thought, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell more bikes. And there were a famous TT rider called David Jeffries who were killed in the TT in 2003. So it were working for his family. Uh, his dad's a famous TT rider. His granddad were a famous TT. Everyone's famous in the Jeffries family for riding. And it turned out that everyone I was selling more bikes to at that time were police officers. And they were like, you should put in. You should, you've got the right temperament. You're a nice person. Put my application form in. That were it. Got a tick. Congratulations. Come do this thing other, and eventually, two thousand one, October the first, two thousand one, you are now nineteen sixty five, based at Keyfle. Start on this day, done and dusted. Never look back. Quick story, that wasn't it? That was a quick story. <laughs> we even we went we went home and away, literally, on that story. <laughs> that was a program from my era. <laughs> you might say, but so there's the element of wanting to help people. Is there any of any selfishness that ever creeps into any of those decision makings at that point? Because if it, even if I if I was thinking I'm going to start a life, you know, I've got a blank canvas. Will I join the force or not? There is there is officers out there being attacked, injured. I have to. Do, well, I've watched programs, many of which you featured on, and I've seen people having to undress men with shit down their backs in the cells. It's the stuff that you think, cool. Like I don't know if there's any amount of money that could that could make me do that is how somebody gets in that headspace to want to be well you're not doing it for money because money's horrendous um when i did join you were doing it for the pension and the um it and, and i don't want to um sound out of line here but you're doing it for the prestige of the job because it were a, you were an upstanding member of the community and i think now that's sort of like that's drifted away a lot um there's a lot of controversy around the police and i think the police need to do a lot to build up public trust I agree with that 100%. But you did it because of the job. You did it for the prestige of, I wanted to be a police officer. I wanted to stand there and help people. I wanted to be the one that people turned to. Uh, and that's what made me want to do it. Um, if I look back now and think, would I have joined if there's any other selfish reasons? The only thing I wish I'd have done is travelled. I wanted to get a camper van and travel when I was younger, but I didn't have the experience. I suppose I was a bit shy, a bit naive. But looking back about what we've done and why we've why I joined and what I wanted to do when I joined, I've achieved all that I wanted to do. Um, I made a really good name for myself. Um, I enjoyed what I did. I put people away for life imprisonment. I were involved in some of the fastest pursuits, taking down murderers, child rapists and everything. 
Um, and I loved it. And I just think it's, I personally think it was one of the best jobs before YouTube. <laughs> one of the best jobs you could ever want to do. And you are going to get so many comments on these videos now about police or this, that, and other. But until you've been there, seen it and done it, and go through what we've done and gone through, um, I'd reserve people to think about stuff first. If somebody did want to um, join the force, or when you joined at the beginning, if I was doing doing that, the first thing, the area that I would want to go to is being behind the wheel of something fast, on a police chase, pursuing something. <laughs> I mean, there's that thing inside all of us that have some sort of addiction to motor racing, fast cars, that would want us to go down that path if we were joining the force of, I'm going to get in a car and I'm going to pursue someone. But obviously it wasn't that simple or it isn't that simple. How do you actually try and um, form your path of where you end up going when you join the force that you're not, you don't end up in the, the role you don't want to be? Or do you have to work all those roles to do the one that you want to do? No, not all. You have to be in for two years. You have to be tutored and then get signed off on your apprenticeship, so to speak. But after two years, you can go anywhere. You can do anything. You can be in the helicopter, firearms, ACT team, which is basically our version of SWAT, um, drugs team, vice team, whatever you want to be, you can do it after two years. We always used to say, I used to be a tutor. So I used to look after the probationers, do a tutor for 10 weeks and then sign them off. You need to have wool on your back. You need to learn what a burger is. You need to know what a rape is because you might not cover it in your first two years. You need to know how to deal with a major scene such as a fatal collision and have that confidence to be able to do that. But once you've done your two years, you can sign off and do it. Now, the main thing is, this is what's really funny about what you just said. Everyone hates traffic for the fact you've got to deal with bumps. Everyone wants to be in traffic because someone has the pursuits. So they don't want to deal with bumps, but they want to deal with pursuits. And that's why I hated. I wanted to drive the car fast, but I didn't want to deal with collisions. I was like, it's scary. Oh, okay. So I wanted to drive the car fast. I didn't want to deal with collisions. So I thought, right, I'm going to go to firearms. And then that's how everyone wants to deal with it. Got firearms, got firearms. So at my time, there were me and a few friends, and we all put in to go to ops, operational support. Um, uh, and I started getting in a few failed stops at the time. We were driving little Astros, 1.6 Astros, flying around streets in these Astros, and now we're getting in a few pursuits. And all my friends put in an application form for firearms, and they all got in. And I put my application in, and then the, the I think it was superintendent, or chief superintendent went, you're not going, you're staying here in division because we want you to work in division with us. Uh, I'll sign up for traffic now, and I'll make sure you work at Keithley where I'm working, so you don't have to move to Wakefield, which were along Slog. So that sold it for me. It was like, imagine you being at home, and rather than going to work, doing all your podcasts and interviews there, they will all come to you the and make it easier. The dream, yeah. yeah. So I was like, yeah, I'll do that then. So I stayed at Keithley. They said, right, you're in traffic. I'd meet interview, you're in traffic. Here's your keys for your T5. Uh, here's your training courses, and that's it, done and dusted. So that's how I got in the traffic. I actually wanted to firearms, but I got in the traffic that way, and it just it felt really, really good. It felt really easy, and it felt like I'd been blessed in, if that makes sense. You, you said so really interesting that, again, uh, as somebody hearing about all of this and, and sort of taking it in, you don't think about at all, or I certainly didn't, which is you want to be in pursuits because the pursuit part of that role is the bit that you want to be doing, the team blocking somebody in, everybody gets out of the car, Nobody's injured. You caught the criminal, locked him away, done. But you mentioned the the other fifty percent. The other part of that is actually the point where that comes to an end the wrong way. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really consider that. Obviously, being being as big a part of that role as it is, but of course that does happen. Like, what percentage of pursuits would end? How you would maybe classify them as well? Oh, well, that's exactly how it should have been done. We t block block them in on the so and so. T block. What's it? Team back. Sorry, <laughs> we're editing this. Um, <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> we team back the men. The scene shows what I know, and I watched police in the steps for years. But I was too busy scratching me Chinese when the, <laughs> the voiceover came on, as you can see. But if you had a really good pursuit that ended well, versus one was it fifty fifty? Like, no, you don't really get a lot of pursuits that end tactically perfect. You might have to just say out of a hundred pursuits, you might have probably have five that'll land up in a proper T pack where it's no paperwork, it's a pack, and you do a form afterwards. Most pursuits are involving Hanoi burglars, so they've taken your Porsche car keys, your R6 car keys. It's been something from an ATM job, a bank robbery or whatever. So they're trying to get away, so they're smashing your cars up. So 
as soon as you smash your cars up, there's massive reports you've got to do. Um, so most pursuits do end up with cars smashed up. That's how it will be. It's just a percentage. And the, there's always this thing of a proper tea pack is you're not meant to make contact with any cars. You form the box and you bring it down. I don't know anyone that's in a stolen £70,000 Audi RS6. Just burgled three houses, that's going to stop in the car. They force a way out because they want to get away. So the ram, the reverse ram, that's why now I've got the bulge disc in my spine. So I'll show you a picture of um, when I got reverse rammed in a 330. And I spent three days in hospital from a reverse ram because it dislodged my hip. It gave me internal bruising. It ripped a stent I had from a kidney into my bladder. Um, did all sorts of damage to me just from one reverse ram. So this is what you've got to put yourself through. But when I said collisions as well, I mean the fail collisions. So the things with the children, knocking on people's doors, saying your you eight-year-old boy's never coming home again, um, saying to a boy, your mum and dad's never coming home again, or telling a family that they've lost three sons in a collision. That's the bit that people don't want to be doing. Um, and that's what broke me in general because of the, you've got to take it on your shoulders all the time and you say it's part of the job. And it is part of the job. It's why you join the job. There's only so many burning children you can see. There's only so many um, dead bodies you can see that are mutilated after being hit by, by a train or in a car crash where you're picking up limbs at side of road. Sorry if I'm going too far with this, where you're picking up limbs at side of road or things like that. There's only so much a human being can see. Um, and that's what people don't like to deal with. They want to have the pursuits, but they don't want to deal with the, the crap aspect. People understand that when they're joining the force? No, no one understands that. Um, you know it's going to be about. You know you're going to get solid. You know you're going to have a foot chase. You know you're going to be part of a big event at some part in life, whether it's um, a Robert Williams concert or a bombing or a plane crash or a train. There's going to be some big events that are going to lead to you. And people know they're going to see dead bodies because it's part of your training. But there's a difference between Mrs. Miggins laying in the bed that's died at 98 years old and she's laid there and you've just got to... Uh, do some checks and that sort of thing and call them the takers to pulling a dead child out of a car when cars on fire and there's a massive difference um, and that's what people struggle to understand and there's no technical outlay and there's no venting so when you come in it's all kind of a, um, a very alpha it's not alpha male it's alpha female it's a very alpha so you come in an office after yeah I've just done this I've just done now yeah. and you know you want to cry you know you're dying inside but you can't sit down in the corner and say I'm and I'm struggling here and that's the that's the hardest thing to think about because if you do it's like they look at you and shake their head because it's just not it's like imagine being in SES or SBS or whatever and doing what you're doing and sat in corner you don't do that that's not part of your role you've got to uphold this role of because it almost takes you out of character to what yeah. everybody else should see you as being and yeah that's um that's really profound you, you, it's the things that you don't see when you're scanning your Chinese watching a programme for 40 you minutes. You see the good bits, don't you? <laughs> you see the good bits. So t tell us a little bit about, before we get into some of those stories and really get some things across, how did, um, in fact, no, would the Ben that joined the force have started a YouTube channel 19 years later if, I think I got that right, if it wasn't for the actual filming of a TV show during your, your yeah. job? Absolutely not, no. 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 So, so th that is what I'm imagining when you joined, you were not the kind of person that would pick up a, a camera no. and talk to the camera. So tell us how the hell you've gone from being a police interceptor to one of the most recognised policemen in the country, basically, from being on that show. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a weird path, but I was confident when I was a kid, I was say when I joined the force, because that's you've got to do your job. But not as in like, oh, this is media. I'd say media confident or hold yourself up in a public area or you know how we've got to do stuff now, dealing with the jobs we deal with. Um, and then interceptors centres, and what people don't realise is interceptors are viewed all over the world. And I can't stress that enough. So we're getting off playing at JFK Airport and interceptor when you get in your bag and you're like looking around thinking, please stop shouting at me. And I like, intercept and you're oh God. And then you're walking on beach in Alicante in Spain and all you can hear is interceptor, you know, chase me. It's every it's everywhere. You I think people just think it's in England, it's not. It's it's watched all over the world. Um and it centers to this place that we we're just bobbies, we don't know what we're dealing with. 
Um, we didn't have any media training. They didn't say this is going to come your way, that's going to come your way, you're going to be stopped by members of the public who want to take photographs or want autographs. We never understood that. And then when you're out with your family in park and you're getting a lot of people come over to you and want the photo, it's bizarre. It's real, because you're just thinking, I'm just Ben from Proper Traffic. I'm nothing special. I'm just Ben. I'm, I, I'm still, just filming what I do. Yeah, I wipe, I wipe, still wipe my ass, still pick my nose, still do what you know. <laughs> Still do what you normally do. Um, I don't see any different. Why me? That sort of thing. But then when I came out of the police, I had a lot of stuff that I wanted to talk about. I had a lot of build up um, frustration. I had a lot of stuff to talk about with my mental health. And I thought podcasting, the official podcast thing, was the way to go. And I thought it'd be really, really easy. So I thought, right, I want to set up a podcast. And I spoke to um, a local famous DJ called Danny Milo does the Pulse Radio. And he says, I've got a lad called Josh Gudgeon. I believe you might know Josh. Yeah. He says, I've got a lad called Josh Gudgeon who does podcasting. Um, I think it'd be really, really good for you. So what part, you've got to understand as well, part of me, and this is I just start crying. So please bear with me if I do. And everyone out there watching, don't laugh. Um, and he says, uh, say, oops, I had a phone call with Josh. And it was very, very cut and dry. You know, my secretary set up this up. You've got 10 minutes of my time. Go. I'm Ben Pearson, blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, tell me when your story is. And I told him the story of the, of the Porsche. Um, I can tell you now, if you want. It won't take long. Go for it. Uh, so I went to um, uh, a, a, a collision one afternoon with a Porsche. Gentleman was going home from his work to uh, go on holiday with family. Went through some twisty bends, giving some big beans in his... Posh box tail, loses control, flips his posh, turns over in the woods and impales himself through a tree. We get there, start doing CPR on this gentleman who's impaled in the tree sideways in the posh. Um, eventually, it passes away. It gets extracted from the car. I'm searching him. Um, all I can hear is, mmm, mmm, like that. And he's searching body at side of the road, pulls out his mobile phone, and it says, wifey on it. I should have said wife or wifey on it. Something like that. Um, and then uh, it's, you've got to understand it's a longer story. I'm just giving you the, the briefs of it. So we send to someone to do a family liaison visit. So basically a death visit, death warning to say, is this person your relative? If so, they're not coming home, they've been killed in a crash. So they do the PNC checks, go to the gentleman's address, knock on the door. Uh, just say, for instance, uh, Mrs. Fowler. Um, yeah, um, Ben Fowler's wife, yeah, can we come in? Unfortunately, we've got some bad news. Ben's been, and she, she, her words were, well, he's been killed in a car crash, hasn't he? And they said, yeah, unfortunately. Well, that's why I'm ringing him, because we're, we're going on holiday now. Kids have been saying, uh, Daddy's not coming home, he's just been killed in a car crash. And she's ringing his phone as I'm holding his phone, because the kids have said. And then that instantly, just like, boom, takes over home, because like, is it real? Have they got a sixth sense? Have they understood it? Did they just think something out of the blue? But when I'm still holding his phone... The kids have said it to the wife, and the wife's ringing the phone, and I'm stood there over the body of this bloke. And it just sent me, it just freaked me out, it just went boom, and I told this story to Josh, and Josh was sat there like, how was you did with mouth open? He says, this isn't a podcast, this is a YouTube channel. He says, come in, and we'll do a YouTube channel. So he filmed the first six videos at studio, put them out there, and I think first video got some like 560,000 views, and it just went on and on and on, and it just, again sent me on this tangent to somewhere where I think, well, I don't know what I'm doing. What, what, why am I doing this? But then people seem to like what we're talking about and it just went on from there. But that is incredible. Um, and obviously I think people are going to have to realise that when you're in, especially in this environment, because uh, doing podcasts, as you know, as a podcaster, is um, it's different when you're in an open environment with many people walking around, sometimes when you're a little bit more closed in. And even as a host, I sometimes sit and go, Wow, what have I just heard? Um, I definitely think that's going to happen a bit today. But I don't want to, I want to try and stick to it. I don't want to skip over actually those 19 years. It was 19 yeah. years, wasn't it, in the force? Because what you're doing now is unbelievable. And some of the plans that you've got now is unbelievable. And I think part of the story is ro road success is you've gone through unbelievable highs and lows and spinning moments and like you're in a washing machine during your career. And to many people, getting to that level is awesome. And then you come out and then been like, right, what the hell am I going to do now? And turn something into something tangible. But those years in the force, do you like talking about them? 
Yeah, I do. Yeah, because it's part of who I am. I can't bury that over those 19 years. It, it's I've seen I've seen things that no one else will ever see. I've done things that no one else will ever do. How many times can you say oh, I've been an outrider for Prime Minister or whatever on my motorbike? Uh, how many times can you say you've chased a car at 155 mile an hour in normal traffic? Or how many times can you have a gun thrust in your face or someone trying to cut your throat on duty? It's scary when you're in it, but then when you get back and you're living the dream at work and thinking like, well, this is what's just happened, you think, Christ almighty. But it's just part of the job, it's part of the role, it's part of what you've accepted to do. And I'm not saying you numb yourself down from it, but nothing seems bad anymore. So just let me give you this example. My partner's a detective sergeant. I give her a kiss at night time when I'm going out tonight and on shift. Don't know about that. <laughs> I give her a kiss and say, all right, love you, see you, see you tomorrow. She knew that that might be the last time she ever saw me and I knew that I might not go home that night. So there's been so many times that there's been knock at door in the morning, say at four in the morning, and there's one of my colleagues stood there with my personal car and her first words of right, what hospitals is in. And this is how our life was. So even when we got his first daughter, uh, he was just like, right, where is he? Oh, he's at BRI, Ward 24. Right, what's happened to him? Right, he's done this, he's done that, and he's been mowed down, and he's got a broken arm. And that's how you live your life at the time. And we always used to say, unless it's a potential fatal, so unless I'm dying or I'm dead, don't alter your, your routine at all. Just do go about your routine, go to work, take the kids to school, do what you name and do, contact me by phone or ask for the ward to give me the phone. And that's it. And then I either come when you can or I'll see you in a couple of days when I'm released. And that's how a lot of Bobbies have their lives in that structure. But after 19 years, no talking about it. I love talking about it because I've seen things and done things that well, not a lot of people have done before. Do you remember the first moment that made you realise that everything was very real rather than... in? Obviously, you've joined and you have a picture of everything you're going to do and you think about all those 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 really good bits. Do you remember the first scary moment? Yeah. And I, is that quite an awakening? Yeah, so uh, one of the moments that really, really touched me, um, and when I say touched me, I don't mean in a good way, which freaked me out, is I was on patrol. With, I was tutoring a girl called Hannah. I think she'd been in a couple of days, and we ended up with the... Uh, we ended up having a fight base with two lads. So Keithley, it's a bit of a rough town, and everywhere you went, everyone was... Can I swear on this podcast? Yeah, of course you can. So everyone might fucking pig, you know, smelly bacon, C-U-N-T, or whatever it is, and it just got worse and worse and worse. We're driving around this area, and these two lads were just at it all the time. Um, we, right, this is it. We're going to have to have a word with them. It's, people are noticing what's going on here, and this isn't, this isn't good for anybody, so stop. Please stop, or you're going to have to get locked up. Just go about your business, you know, enjoy your Saturday night, go um, a few, a few, blah, 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 blah. So we had to cut out. And it's Hannah, she's only been learning job. I think she's been in less than a week. Um, next thing you know, his dad throws a punch. So we're going to a bit of a grapple, get cuffs on really quickly. And by that time, his, his mate is coming at me again. So me and his mate end up then rolling around on the floor. Uh, this is night time, probably about 12 o'clock at night, roads are wet, car still going backwards and forwards. We're rolling around carriageway. He's no bigger than me and he's no stronger than me. We're the same size. So we're exactly matched size-wise, strength-wise. So we're going into grapples, and I can't overpower him, he can't overpower me. And it's getting to this point of like, well, what do I do here? Um, I've already put a code zero out, which officers are, officers needs urgent assistance is being under attack. Um, and then I can see a glint in the corner of my eye. I can see something shiny in the corner of my eye. And as I put my hand up, I can just see this knife. And it's about five inches away from my face. And it's coming closer. So I'm wrestling now. And I can say, I'm like, okay, it's got a knife here. And he's pushing it towards my face. And I'm laid on the road, then I'm on top of him, then he's on top of me, and you, you can't let go. Because you think, if I let go for a second, I don't know what his intention is, I don't know what he's going to be doing, I don't know how this is going to end up. So we're rolling around the floor, cameras watch it, um, Bradford watch, they turn around and watch cameras, and then ACR starts showing up for all units, all units. Ben's fighting, There's, Ben's under kin, massive attack here. So everyone starts getting to the scene and I just remember this Volvo T5 skidding up and like called Phil his nickname was Puncher I can't tell you why he was called Puncher but he was called Puncher and I just heard this like oh, as he got yanked off me and he ended up folded up in this ball in the middle of the road as he was getting ragged round by all these bobbies um, turns out he had like a, a Stalin I've struck box cutter he'd been out in yeah, his work yeah, gear yeah. and then literally the next thing you know he's racked it out and he's trying to cut my face on my throat and I'm like if I had to let go 
where would it have gone? Would it have gone down my face? It would really, it would proper like a stomach. Would it have gone through my face? Would it have gone through my eye? Would it have gone through my neck? And where it was, it was going towards my throat. Got back to Nick and all fine. And within 10 minutes, I was shaking. I couldn't control the adrenaline that was going through my body. It were horrendous. And um, by that time, you, you wet through while your pants are wet, your box shorts are wet. It's a weird sensation because you're only like probably four hours into your shift. So you, you can't, you don't go home. You just get changed and crack on, go back to your job again. You have 10 minutes, sit down with a cup of tea. But the adrenaline through my veins, the adrenaline that we're feeling was just bizarre. Knowing that it could have all gone wrong, but you'll never know. And that's really weird and think, well, bizarre, I've had a near death experience. It's not a near death experience. But you think it could have gone really wrong with this. And if it had gone wrong, where would I have been then? What would have gone on? And they're the days you've got to sort of like take on board, understand what's going on, but also put behind you. Because if you carry it, I carried it and I ended up breaking. If you carry it, it's just going to destroy you. Let the book change, let the, pa the page change and the chapter change. It's still in the book, but it's gone. Change the page and move forward. Uh, and this is what a lot of Bobbies at the moment, I don't think are dealing with it right well. We've reached that part of the episode where I try and sell you something, but hold on, I promise it's worth your while. Back in the summer, I invested in a street food business called Gert Wings. Quite simply, the best chicken and sauce I've ever tasted. We've now decided to put all those sauces in amazing looking bottles and even our chicken salt. Go and check out our brand new online store and try some of our sources at gertsources.com or click the link in the description of this video. If you use the code BEN10, you'll also get a discount. So hopefully you can look forward to getting saucy. Why does that happen? This is the question that when I watch this, this stuff is there's so many people out there that clearly need some sort of help. And, and maybe we just don't get to see the environment that people are raised in. There's more programs now and you, you see people going into really rough estates in Birmingham. I watched it. And it's like a it's like a totally different world. It's like a ghost town. And yeah. it looks to me and many others unpleased, yeah. unlawed yeah. in a way, because what, what Bobby's gonna want to go in there, same with some of the gypsy sites and um travelling communities. And it's 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 really frightening. But what makes that guy so pent up with rage that he is willing because you've got all the things going through your head if you're in a grapple like that, and I'm sure you've had many, of I need to watch this knife, I need to call for support, it's a code zero, trying to also think through it. But surely that must be something in his head while he's in that moment, similar that goes, if I do this, the result is X, the result is me in, in jail locked up for this, probably. Why, what causes people to react like that? Yeah. So again, what I was saying at the beginning of this podcast is people, there's two sets of people in the world. There's people that live in our lives that go to work Monday to Friday, nine to five, have a family, yep. do the Christmas thing, do what they normally do or eat or everything, do the normal, what you call normal life, live the normal life. Then you've got the other side of society, which don't, and they don't function how we function. This is what we're about. We're trying to keep this element away from normal people because you there's people that don't understand nine to five there's people that go out burgling on christmas eve and christmas day they don't understand it's christmas oh why can you do this at christmas it doesn't bother them there's people that are on so much either drugs or so much criminality that their lives are built around the structure that we build our lives around and they don't think of like instantly then you'd have thought because you've been brought up in a normal environment this is bad they don't think like that. They just think, I want to get away. They don't think of the consequences. They just think, well, it's an officer in uniform. It's not a human being. We have fights where we're laid on floor. People just come out from pub and start kicking you because they see a police logo on the floor. They don't know what's going on. They don't know who Bobby is. They don't know this could have been a murder and Bobby's jumped on him. But they just start kicking you because they see the uniform. So they're taking the frustration out on the uniform. So if you look at it now, our policing's got we, you police from laws that were made up in 1800s and were policed by what's called consent. So if I say to you, um, and there's an allegation of theft, I need you now to come with me to the police station so I can interview you in regards to the allegation, you are meant to say, okay, I will follow you. That's policing by consent. That doesn't happen anymore. So if I say to you now, Ben, come with me. No, I'm not giving my name, I'm not coming with you. So how do I police by consent then? The only thing I can do is police by force where I put some cuffs on you and drag you. 
But then you're saying, well, that's my human rights. So we've lost sort of like a, an element in society by policing by consent because we're not at that point in life anymore. Those days in 1800s, early 1900s, police by consent have gone. We don't live in that world anymore. And if we don't live in that world anymore and we're dealing with these criminals that don't have the, the nine to five structure in their life, we're always on a downward scale. We're always losing every single battle we have because we've got to live by regulations, laws, codes of practice, honourable stuff where they don't, they don't respect what we're trying to do and they don't respect how we live and what, we, what we're trying to achieve in the society itself, like trying to create a better tomorrow. All they want to do is steal, burgle, commit crime, upset, hurt, destroy. And then, they're not, well, you've got another six years. Well, my dad's been in prison all his life. My nan's been in prison most of her life. My granddad's been in prison most of her life. And it's a kudos. I've been locked up for assaulting a PC. Yay! Parties. And that's what we don't get. That's what the normal members of the public don't see. They don't see that element of society. And would you say that is all driven by drugs these days or a variety or most of it? Because when I think back, and again, you can only relate to maybe, I'm relating to a lot of TV, a lot of clips, a lot of things that you grew up with as a child, painting your picture of what you think police has to deal with or what robbers are, all the rest of it. And I remember when you were a kid, you have this picture of um, a robber and they probably are out there, someone that goes into a house maybe wearing blue bags over their shoes and they've opened a drawer and as everybody says it's always the robber that you don't think yeah um you'll never catch is the one that when you've gone in the drawer and so something's gone and you think yeah. i must have lost that is that yeah. is the best sort does that still exist or is it all now just absolute brute force because i will just actually add i have a, a friend that doesn't live too far away he'll be known to many i think he's also done some stuff on channel five supercar nigel one of the loveliest guys I've ever met. He was actually the first podcast I ever did. And I went to his home and when you get there, it's like Fort Knox. Mm. Gates, barbed wire. You, you, it doesn't look like you could get in. Cameras. He's got staff there. His business is at home. And he still has people trying it on. And to the point that he had one night in his house, three lads coming up the stairs. He heard a commotion. He forced himself in the room. And they were willing to hurt him, yeah, to, to steal. They they were, and he actually um, told the story of how he had to deter them. I think he shot through the door or something. Excuse me if I've got it wrong. Um, and then they just scattered. But that to me is unbelievably frightening compared to the person that goes in a house and removes someone you don't even know. What exists anymore, or is it all just brute force? No. So you've you've all you've got your low level crime. You've got your drugs. You've got your um, but it's dealer, you've got your theft from shops, you've got your normal, what your class is, your low level crime. Um, yeah, nicking from a shop, you know, I mean, little things like that. But then you've got your organized crime group. And this is what people don't realize the structure of an organized crime group. And that can go down from, I'm not saying it is because I don't know, but that can go down from a celebrity. Um, so, like, you know, you see these people like Dave Courtney or all these other people, these celebrities, or I'm not saying crazy because they're not around anymore, but someone that's, quite famous it could be someone in in a prestigious job or whatever and that goes down these can go worldwide can organize crime groups then you'll have a crime group that runs manchester crime group that runs liverpool um you don't go on each other's patches that's why certain crime members get shot and killed um and then they can do anything so just say for instance um one of the biggest things in west yorkshire were hanoi cats so where they're breaking into your house to steal your car keys and then they've got to the point of where the door breaking your house they'll scan your car but if they can't scan your car, then they'll force your door. And they'll stand up bottom of the stairs. If you don't give me your keys, I'll come up and I'll kill your children, rape your wife, kind of thing. Most people throw the keys downstairs because what would you do? You throw your keys downstairs. Um, within probably two hours, your car could be in a container and getting loaded up to go on a ferry uh, or on a ship going to Abu Dhabi and you'd never see your car again. If it was something very prestigious, it could be broke up with parts within a couple of minutes, shipped out somewhere. Um, these things go on everywhere and just say for instance they're looking at an SVR what say 130 grand SVR Range Rover and they'll say right I want this Range Rover I want it in blue and I want this spec there's only one there in Ben Fowler's got it it's at this house it's done this that and other right so they'll say I'll give you five grand got rid of mine now <laughs> and did have one in blue just like that it's gone gone for Nito yeah what about a Porsche 930 that's at a dealer somewhere in London that's all good um 
So yeah, so they could say, right, I'll give you five grand. So for some shit bags, five grand for one hour's work. It's not a bad deal of it if they're coming from a like this estate that you said in Birmingham and they've got fuck all. Five grand's like winning winning lottery, innit? So what will they do when they turn up at your house to get these car keys? And that's what you've got to think about and how people do it. We've had people where they've used machetes and started hacking people for the car keys. We've had people where they're threatening to burn the house down or cover people in petrol. We've had all sorts of things. And this is what you've got to understand that it, it's just a car. I've got a new Gold GTI. I don't give my car keys up. I'd say come and get them. I don't understand that law anymore, but I'm not a police officer. I'm a member of the public. I'm not saying I'd break the law, but I'm not going to give my stuff to when I've looked at a lot of these organised crime groups. Yeah, it might be seven 19-year-old lads thin as a rake and they're using fear to get what they want out of people. They're using that element of surprise and fear where if you challenge them, they'll probably run off. But I'm not saying challenge them, but this is how it gets. And again, back to this police wall, this is why the police are there because they try and keep that away from normal members of the society. If you look at where you live, cat type in houses burgled in my area and it'll show you how many bur- houses have been burgled on the map, how much crime's taken place. You might not see. I knew... I could go to work one night and I knew, in theory, all the paedophiles, all the rapists, all the murderers, all the stolen cars and everything that had taken place in, say, five square miles. I wouldn't have a clue now because I'm out of that. that net. Five square miles. Yeah, but this miles. is what I'm saying. So I could go into Asda shopping. This is one of the things of the job. And I'd be stood next to a paedophile that I know has just been released from prison for ten, from seven, ten years. And I'd be stood next to him in Asda. And I can't say to anybody, this is this bloke. You can't do that. So you know stuff, you do stuff. So this is what I'm saying, we try and keep that element away from you. But that element is always there. This is why I always say now, you can't have anything without trying to protect it. You can't have luxury goods without trying to protect them. And the element will always be there and it'll never go away. It either gets more sophisticated or more violent. And it'll never go away. So do you think there is an element of solving it or is it always fighting? Someone told me, um, I, lo- I love the police, I love what they stand for, I love who they are, and I love everything about them. And uh, like I said, I recommend anyone to join the police, but someone told me when I retired is, if you think about it, the police is just a wall of blue. That's it. And it keeps, like a, a wave, it keeps the element of shit away from decent people. And then when I retire, I step away from this wave, that's holding it back and someone else fills my spot. And ever since the police were created, that's what they do, the oldest wave of shit back. Now, you can make a difference. So we locked this lad up on intercepts. I pursued a lad that was 12-year-old um, through Bingley, 100 mile an hour in a stolen car. He went to prison. And I think crime in Shipley fell down by some like 60%. So that's what you make a difference. But then literally, as soon as he goes, someone else jumps in that spot. So he was 12 years old? He was 12 years old. So what happened to him? He went to prison. But I don't know how long he went to prison. So is that, is that juvenile prison? Uh, yeah, it'll be like a juvenile prison, remand prison kind of thing. Um, Can he even comprehend what he's done? Or is that the kind of character that's grown up in a world where he'll just get out and do it again? Yeah, that's what I mean. So his mum and dad are, his nan and dad, everyone around him is in that culture. So that's what I'm on about with the, the fact of, I put the video out on TikTok and then people were tagging him in it. Oh, it's you, it's you, it's you. And then the amount of people saying, big it up, yeah. And they're proud. They're proud of what he's achieved and what he's done. There's no, oh, can, this lad's just been in embarrassment. They're proud of what he's done. And that's what I'm on about, where I'd be ashamed if I my son, I'd have beaten him black and blue. Obviously, I won't. Um, <laughs> but I'd be ashamed. The family would be ashamed. But they're not, they're bigging him up. And he'll just go out and he commits more crime, more crime. But he's been involved in so many crimes since then, involving stolen cars and... What change? The, the the problem is with, uh, I say the problem is with me, that immediately when I hear problems, uh, and you can tell straight away there's so many problems, and of course you, I'm just sort of, so how do you solve that then? How do you solve that? How do you solve that? My mind starts thinking, how do you solve that? And maybe there is no clear way of, of ever solving or dealing with those people in, in kind of how we live in a society without just throwing more money than our armed forces at it. Yeah. Um, to try and make a difference. But do you think if you took someone that was in, in that position, really desperate, willing to do anything, and they just 
were in the force buddying you for a, a month and saw things, think it would change them? Or do you think their whole upbringing is too much for a, something like a week to make a difference? Yeah, I think uh, someone told me statistics, I think you learn everything by five-year-old, such as your code of ethics in your family. Speak when not spoken to, or are we a mouth shut? That sort of thing. You learn it by five years old and you grow from there. So these core things are always built into you. So if if you haven't learned by 14 to 16, I mean, I remember being 14 to 16, I knew what law was, I knew what police were, I knew what were illegal. And I don't think it'll change. The only time it's going to change is, and I've said this before, if you have a full revamp of the criminal justice system, you have a revamp of the courts and have a revamp of the prison cells um, and how long it's going to be because... You'll go to court, and again, if people watching this have never been to court, if you're a victim, they make you feel like you're the perpetrator. And if you're an officer, they make you feel like you're the criminal to give evidence. And this could be a murder case, this could be a, a whatever case. And it's hard when you stood there and you're being cross-examined and it feels like it's a joke. And you stood there for someone and the cross examining you think, hang on a minute, I'm a Bobby, I swore me off to Queen. I've protected life and limb for 19 years. I've got eight divisional accommodations for bravery, pulling people out of burning cars. There's a lad over there who's been locked up 650 times. He's in prison all his life, in and out, in and out, in and out. Then you question my loyalty and my, and my values and saying that I'm lying in court. And then he stood there and then there's right evidence, of, yeah, found not guilty. And you're thinking like, well, why am I doing it? I've just had a chase with him at 130 mile an hour. I've had a foot chase, I've got out, we've had a fight with him. Um, we've done this, we've done that, not guilty. Because he ran around the corner, I lost sight of him for 1.2 seconds. And jury had found out that, could it have been someone else? Like we're three in the morning and we're on a farm in the middle of nowhere. Could it have been someone else? And he lives 20 miles away and he's known for burglary. Well, no, it couldn't have been, so, well, case dismissed. And you just think, it, this shouldn't be how it is. It should be the other way around where, uh, well, I don't know how it's going to work. I wouldn't know, I'm not that expert, but until it changes and like a proper three strike system or something like that, I, I won't know. But I think it can be changed, but at the moment we're on a highway to nowhere, especially now life's got a bit more flexible with everyone and everything. And I just think that's where it's going to struggle. So you were on police interceptors for three years. We've heard multiple stories of things that we may not see on camera, but we've seen many moments where we have seen a lot of stuff on camera. We obviously know now that you're a huge um, mental health advocate and that you really try and help the armed forces and the police and you've actually invited me up and I will be there um, to an amazing event that you're planning just after doing the podcast here at the motorist. Um, and that involves all the police interceptor cars coming down, many YouTubers, everybody. And it gives a chance for the public to kind of interact with those guys and see them. Um, for us normal folk, I suppose, to thank them for what they do. Um, I don't know, as you say, there might be someone mingling about, uh, amongst just to get kind of information, <laughs> but you never know. But what 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 has led you there? What was what was the moment for you where you had to retire, you couldn't take it anymore? Because I've seen online, you've done another video before, saying that being an in interceptor broke you. Yeah. Why? Um, you've got to live up to a certain stereotype. You've got to live up to being... A uh, nice, smiley, happy, and you're professional at what you do, and you are, and that's that's fantastic. But inside, I just buried my mum, um, who had died from an operation, and then we had to switch the ventilator off. So I took the decision to switch the ventilator off. I gave the nod to the doctors, flicked the switch, and then I held my mum's hand, and she died. I took that decision as a police officer. My, my dad and my brother were builders at the time. I knew what was going on. I got spoken to by the consultant surgeon, and I had that in me trying to process. First day back at work, um, after my funeral, I went to a two-year-old that was decapitated by a 44 ton truck in the carriageway. And again, you're trying to live up to this, hi, I'm Ben Pearson from Police Interceptors. Uh, this is how we do stuff. But inside, I was snapping, I was dying. Um, and I remember being at the scene and it was like a rubber band across my chest and it snapped. And I just, for the first time in my career, I just ended up in tears. Um, and then within six months, my dad sits me down and says, I've got terminal cancer. My dad's my best friend. And he just uh, gets to that Christmas. We hold his hand and he passes away. Really disturbed me and took a lot from me. And then you're on TV, you're asking photos, you're asking for autographs, you're asking people, uh, hi, this is, uh, and it's massively kid-led, interceptors, eight to 14. 
massive fans of the show and you're having a lot of kids come over to you and you're struggling with your mental health, you're struggling with the fact of can't communicate, I can't tell people what I'm feeling. So you cry a lot. So you're meeting kids and you're in tears. And then back to work, fail, fail, fail. And I just end up breaking. Now, once much what you say is the police interceptors thing broke me, but it was the, the whole journey with police interceptors. Because if I didn't have to have the the kudos of who I was, if that makes sense, I didn't have to live up to certain expectations. Um, I think I'd have probably found it easier to deal with the issues. But like one of the things I've always been known about my pursuits, so my pursuit commentary, and this is extremely... Um, when you're a good pursuitist, there's a difference here. So I could be chasing you at 130 mile an hour through a 20 mile an hour limit. And I'd be like, extra Romeo 5, 2, we are now 1, 2, 0 miles an hour. We are now left, left, left. Standby authorization of tactical pursuit. And I were going on pursuits. And everyone knew that I were good at my commentary. And I were going on pursuits. And I'm like, get out of the fucking way. Move. And it would be picked up on camera. And then people said, what's going on here? And then they were realizing that there was something underlying. Get out, me a fucking mouth, mouth. And rather than an ACI control room, like, what's going on here? Got pulled into driver training. And that's how I started pulling the layers back of what was going on. Um, and that's why I started to struggle. And then I just got up to a collision with baby Ben from Interceptors, something and nothing. I'd lost all my permits by this point. Got out of the car. And as soon as I pulled my head out of the A pillar or A post, whatever you want to call it, it just all went. Didn't know who I was. We're in a uniform, didn't know why I were there, could see a police car, ended up peeing in my pants. Just lost it all, lost it all. Just did that, that, that switch, just lost everything, just became half the man I was, and I am half the man I am now. I've got no memory, I've got no... Um, when I say thought process, I want to say like as in... Um, I, like, have you seen that bag that I've got? It's got my diary in, it's got my notes in, I can't live... Someone will message me and I won't be able to understand or comprehend. I've got a checkbook, so and this, I come down in the morning, I've got sticky note pads everywhere, pick the kids up at this time, do this, do that, because there's just, there's nothing there. You know, when you, I, I call it monging, you know, when you see people like, and there's no in them, and they're like, they just say, for instance, they're drunk at Side Road, and like, like, that's what the day to day life's like. You come downstairs and you're just like looking at kettle, and you're thinking, like, there's just not there, just grey matter. And then when you do sleep, you think about the kids that you've never saved. You think about this little boy that run over by a truck, why couldn't I get there earlier? You start thinking about, um, <clears throat> not being funny, why couldn't I save my mum and dad? Why couldn't I, why couldn't I do what, um, sorry. Um, why? Dad has apologised at yeah. all. You get given all this stuff, you get given all this training and then you're hated by a lot of people for what you do. And you think I'll give back 19 years. And then you think, why can't I do this, that, and other? And it just, just takes it. And then when you still le then log online and you're trying to make good content like this for people to watch and you're still having that, fuck the police, defund the police, you scum, you this, you that. And you're thinking like, you've got you, what have you given back to society? What, I don't mean you, obviously, but, but what have you given back to society? What have you done? What have you lost? And then people probably put in, yeah, but you chose the job. Yeah, I did choose the job. But I didn't choose to switch my mum's ventilator off. I didn't choose to go to a two-year-old the first day back at work after my mum's funeral that had been decapitated by a 44-ton truck. Then I didn't choose to hold my dad's hand as he slipped away. And then I didn't choose to have fatal, 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 fatal and have no outgress of how I'm feeling. I didn't choose any of that. And it's just how the circumstances... But I'm not bitter about it. This is what life does. It throws you curveballs. You've got to stand there and say, right, how do I push forward today? How do I make a better difference today or tomorrow? Because as I said to you, that book's turned, that page has turned. Thinking about the past will always bring depression. Thinking about the future will always bring anxiety. Think about today and what you're doing today. Then tomorrow will come. And then think about tomorrow when you're in tomorrow. And that's the way I try and live my life now. I try and make it the best life I've got with the tools I've got. I don't have any money. I don't have that, I don't have that, but I've got two lovely kids. I've got a missus that I love daily. I live in a nice house and I've got a good set of friends around me. Then when you pull it all back to the lad that was trying to cut my face or pulling these people like, out, what do you need in life? Do you need fame? Well, I'm not famous, but I've had that bit of acknowledgement. 
do you need money? Well, I don't need money. I want on good money in the first place, but I don't need money. you surprised if you can cut it back how much you can live on. So what do you want? Do you want happiness? Well, I'm happy. I might be mentally ill, which I'll always be mentally ill. I take tablets for it and I've still have therapy four years on, but my mental health is fantastic. I wake up in the morning and I'm happy. I go to bed at night and I'm happy. I'm happy for what I've got and what I've achieved. And I don't want any more. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'd like to have 100,000 views at every single video. It's nearly that. <laughs> I'd like to have millions of followers on social media, but it's what it is. And I'm happy. I'm happy about what I've done in my life. And when I get to Pearly White Gates and some parents at Paul there, and they'll say, you've made a bit of a difference, haven't you? Go on, go in. I'll be like, yeah, I've done that. And I can't ask for more than that. And I wonder... Um, God, be deep that, didn't it? I, I, I wonder, bless your heart, it's, what's really fascinating about what you've just said there is it's very rare that I'll have a guest on that actually gets to that moment that they go, I'm really happy. I've, I've done it. I've, my road to success. I, I, could, I could snuff it tomorrow and I know that there was nothing left in the tank. It's actually very rare that I kind of come across that because I think even myself included could probably work to the day I was 100 and be worth a billion. I'd ask myself why it wasn't two or whatever or what, wherever the next goal is. And I actually genuinely do worry about that um, for myself, just like just never being, ever being satisfied. But do you think that's just because you've truly experienced what it's like for the memory part of your brain to be full? Like and, and like full of scenes and visions and how we would remember TV. You live real TV and you felt real emotions in that time. Do you think there's a point then when you you talk about mental illness and how that that's obviously clearly had a massive effect on on you now? And I'm I'm actually come to understand more than I thought I would um, sitting here today. But is that a result of? basically just too much memory it's just like the point the glass just over spills and it yeah is at that point the damage is done because obviously when you have a a physical injury as you said it said you bless you were hobbling over the van because you say you slipped disc as part of when you're actually out there and that's a physical injury and you can physically see that behind it but with when you speak about like i know i'm injured mentally but i'm, I'm dealing with it it's like you walked over to the van you can still walk over to the van i can still turn up and still be happy but does the point where that injury really occurs, the tear happen, which you, you said you knew when that moment was, is that a result of just too much stuff entering yeah. the memory? Yeah, you've got, you can only deal with so much so often. I call it my backpack. Your backpack's always 65% full. You're carrying it around with you all the time. It's full with your health. It's full with your home. It's full with your wages. And your money going out and just your general day-to-day -day living. So like what you're doing, where you're going, it's always, and then you might say about your, you have a company, it's got a bit fuller. My bad pack, 65% full. My mum ended up dying, it went to 100% full. We turned my mum's ventilator off. I had to deal with that. Then at 100% full, I had nowhere to put any other emotions. Then the boy died with a, with the truck, so I had nowhere to put it. My backpack's weighing me down, it's getting too heavy. So I had to put, in theory, him under one arm. So now I'm carrying a heavy backpack, fully laden, emotional-wise, and this lad under one arm. Then my dad dies, and I've got nowhere to carry him. So then where do you put that emotion? So then everyone's walking in a hundred metre walk race and you're weighed down with all these things you're carrying. And at one point your brain just goes, I'm telling you what, this is making you poorly. You can't sleep, you can't eat. You're having night terrors. You can't interlink with people. You can't speak to people. Your social etiquette's gone. You've got no filter. You know what I mean? So what I'll do is I'll just pull plug. I'll, I'll take your ECU out of car. Your car's still there, but I'll take its brain out. And I'll just shut it down. I'll let you eat, sleep, shit, pee. That's about it. So boom, pulls it out. You've got nothing left inside you. And then you've got to build yourself up so it's for months you can't get out of bed. Then when you do get out of bed, you get in the shower, then you go back to bed. Then eventually you'll go downstairs. Then eventually you'll walk in a garden. Then eventually you'll start talking to neighbour. Then eventually this will happen. All the time you're contemplating having suicide, issues, you're picking ropes out, you're looking at the trees. But my defining moment where I come sat on the edge of the bath, I was naked. The bath was filled up with hot water. I had a knife on my wrist and I thought, right, if I just jump in bath now, the water will burn me, but it won't feel the knife go through my wrist. 
within three minutes I'll bleed out, bleed to death. And I'm sat there on the edge of bed and I'm shaking and I just think, I can't do it. I can't leave my kids the trauma that that'll be leaving on me, on them. I'm not pushing it down the scale to leave them damaged. And some it just, just some it just went. Um, I can't I can't say what it is. I can't say everyone's got their own journey. Um, but this is what everyone's got to go through. This is what everything's. Everyone's got to go through certain issues. It's not me. This is this is not a sad feel sad for Ben Day. Everyone's got their own issues. Everyone's got their own. And if they say they don't, they don't. But they're lying. Everyone's got some sort of worries. And you've got that backpack, and it depends how full your backpack is today. And I talk about my backpack all the time, and that's why I think it started a bit more cathartic for me. So I talk about my issues, and it releases those demons. And I'm like, hang on a minute, the more I talk, the more podcasts I do, the more I talk about mental health, PTSD awareness, it comes down that little bit. So then I eventually put my dad to bed. I eventually put my mum to bed, and I eventually put this little boy to bed. I still carry it around with me, but it's not in my backpack if that makes sense. Do you, it does make sense. Do you then, how have you used that energy? Because there's there's something in there, and I, I think it's toughness. I think there is an underlying toughness that's probably handed down from under. You still just can't get rid of that toughness trait. It's like, right, we get back up, still we rise, is Hamilton's phrase. Why, how did you get, because obviously when we speak, we laughed about the start of the episode, we went to Spain and we came back in the space of three seconds. During that conversation there, you mentioned that that is actually, and it's just to kind of get this across to the listeners, that's a period of months that I took in there that it takes to make little short steps yeah. from, from where you were to where you are now. But if we actually look at where you are now... <laughs> yeah. Two bucks. Yeah. That's not the Organising events, YouTube, security, all kinds of stuff like that. Just explain... How you've risen back up, and why? What you think those key emotions are? What, 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 what is the? If, if you're already happy with where you are, and you're happy to go to the pearly gates of what you've achieved and what you've done, why are you doing what you do now? Keep me sane, so I don't end up doing something stupid. Um, I've always got to have a goal, and I don't think you should ever be stagnant in life. And I think there is an issue with being stagnant. And I think if I can't help people in uniform, why can't I help people with our branding or our clothing or why can't I write something down that people enjoy reading? Or why can't I do something that people enjoy getting together? There's always got to be something. Uh, and it, it it wasn't, but I remember my granddad when he retired, he was the older generation, and he'd sit there in a suit watching horse racing. He'd garden in a suit because this is what old people did in the 80s. That, say when they were 78 year old in the 80s and 90s, they'd garden in a suit. That's how they were dressed in the 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, and I think if you switch off, you become stagnant. And I don't want to become stagnant. I've got so much in me. I've got so much tingling. If someone says, here's a pound, go do something with a pound, I'd hopefully within a week come back and say, there's £10. And in two weeks, there's £100. It's not about investing. It's, all, it's just about doing. And I want to do. I want to meet. I want to meet. I've never met you before. But it's the kind of thing where we could go to a pub and we could have a beer. Now, my life's richer now I've met you. And I could go back and, oh, have you met so-and-so? I've met him. He's a right good bloke. Like when Ben Collins reached out, we ended up, driving with Ben, never met him before, giving me a massive hug, and it made me feel like, do you want to come and have a Christmas dinner? And I thought, that is how I grow. So I can go and say, have you done this? Brilliant. I don't want anything from it. I don't want anything from who I meet. All I want to do is go, and I've had a good time. I could either be at Fatal pulling a kid out of my car, or I could be sat at the motorist cafe now, in the back of a transit van with a bloke I've just met, but that sounds really weird, doesn't it? <laughs> that sounds like something you'd have dealt with a few years ago, yeah. to be honest. But do you see what I mean? And I think this is how life should be led. I think life should be worth living. And this is what we're doing now. So just explain, you have a clothing brand as well. You have a brand. T talk to us about your, your stuff. So just explain. So we've got 1965 PTSD awareness. Now, 1965 were my collar number in the police. So PTSD awareness is, is why... We do it now. Again, nothing to do with the police, but I feel like I didn't have the treatment that I needed at the time. It's led me now. I still pay £75 a week for my personal private medical health care for trauma therapy, CBT therapy. So what we do is we raise money now, either through his clothing, through his events and through everything we do, to give to the police treatment centre 
at Harrogate. So when people are, are damaged mentally or physically, they can go. The Firefighters Charity, which is the same for the firefighters, Andy's Man Club, because there's a lot of police that go to Andy's Man Club, or what's called PTSD 999. And they're the ones that go around organisations and give you first aid training, mental health training, awareness and stuff. And we fund that. Um, we don't take anything from it ourselves. We don't take any wages. We don't even put us petrol or anything. All comes out of his own pockets. And it's just that bit of giving back. And for me personally, it's it's a quest to just right, right the wrongs, put the slate clean, make an effort for stuff that I've done when I were a kid, mucking about. I, I mean, it's in my book. I might as well tell you there's no issues. I was driving cars on the road when I was 15. Um, there, there's, there's things that I just think I'm just making a, a better tomorrow. And that's all I want to do is make a better tomorrow. So we've made the clothing up. It sells like hot cake, sells all over Europe. When's your next event? Uh, the one um, here? So we're going to hold cops and cars here on the 3rd of August. So that's all interceptors, traffic cops, and motorway cops from Channel 5, um, Leeds Supercar Me, and his man club. But we have all the pursuit vehicles that you can see on TV here, all the rare ones, uh, American pursuit vehicles, XR Owners Club's coming up this time as well to get involved. The army's coming. Uh, it's, it's massive. Thousands and thousands of people come. This is the third year. We're also going to be doing an evening with me here. We're going to try and organise it for April as well. Um, and yeah, we're just trying to do this uh, dra live and drive as well. If you can figure out how to do that, where you turn up and you'll be able to drive some police cars. And So there's, there's all sorts happening. And then we've got the black tie ball that's sold out within a day. So yeah, it's, it's all going on and it's going well. We're happy. The only question that I really want to ask that I think is um, a huge point has been really profound to ask ex officer. I understand, and you can see the emotion. You described that story of when you were in court, and they, the the guy that did it gets away with it. You lost sight for one book, two seconds, and you think, ah. Oh. But then you also have got the the frustration with the public when they comment negative things in your videos. And I could almost bet every pound that I own that there will still be someone that could watch this the whole way through and will comment something just because you're in the piece from the description. However. If I try and be neutral for a minute, uh, my friend who actually built and kitted out this van, Vince, um, was at, at a site last week. Again, it's a bit like you say with the kids stealing from the shop, it's because it's so frequent. Gets his whole van cleared out while he's in front of it. Doesn't even know it's happened. They've cleared all the tools out of his van. The way he then reported that to the police, had information, camera, everything that was hers, just vanished. The minute he told me about it, I was like, yeah, okay, get anywhere, mate. Pointless, it's lawless. No, there's nothing that's going to happen. And he is so angry. And then when you look at, you look at it, of just how little can happen with so much evidence, bring it back to that, that it will then make those people fundamentally furious. And of course, they don't care because they're just like, when I needed you, it wasn't there. Now, we hear that, that it's almost like um, I heard, I watched the interview of Piers Morgan and Rishi Sunak the other day. I was talking about the NHS and Piers Morgan has actually summarised it brilliantly. He said, when you get to the top, when you get to the top, when you need the, the serious operation, when you need X, when you need Y, it is fantastic. But it's the bit in the middle between going in and getting there that's broken at the minute. And it's like with the police, if, if I've got someone in my house, I can pretty much make a phone call and I know someone will be coming especially if it's really serious, they're going to try and murder me. Someone's on their way. When, that's excellent to live in a country like that, many are not. But do you understand why when you've had a builder that can't make a living because he's been robbed three times and when he phones up for his inquiry, it's been lost in paperwork. It has nothing's happened. Why people get so frustrated? 100%, because I, I happened to me as well. Um, someone outside, outside my house run over my cab on it. We rung it in. The people who attended knew who we were and just got filed. But all hours have got CCTV, and even though it was me, and it was partner Miller, who was in job as well, no. And we've seen it from when I joined in 2001, when bobbies were everywhere, to now, when the government's caught all bobbies, and you get told, so you've got to understand it's not the police officers, it's what you get told to do. So you'll come in one day and I'll say, right, we're not turning out now to X, Y, and Z. And you're like, right. Why? Well, we don't have enough staff. We don't have this. So if I say, I don't know where you live, but just say, for instance, pick your four closest towns to you. Right, so 
But if I said, right, for Swindon, on Friday night, you've got one traffic cop. That's it. So they'll say, right, unless it's a serious or fatal collision, you don't go 20 bumps. So you get told what to do. And then we're all like you. We're sat there going, hang on a minute. Someone's just doing some damage. But then I go lock that person up for damage. And then next thing you know, a motorcyclist comes off and is killed. Well, I'm especially sure traffic cop that investigates that. So then you think your motorcyclist family, do you want a beat Bobby turn up or do you want the traffic cop who's the expert? So that's why they keep you free. And that, we've just been a, a cog in the wheel and we've sat there. Some Friday nights, we've sat there, New Year's Eve, right, you've got a no arrest policy, don't lock anybody up, cells are full. And you're like, well, what am I supposed to do now? Well, don't, we've got nowhere to put them. All the cells in West Yorkshire, North Yorkshire and South Yorkshire are full. What do you do? So unless it's a murder, a rape or a violent stabbing stroke assault, don't lock anyone up. What do you want me to do? And that's how it works. And I'm because like, where do you, pay? there's a thing called PACE, Police and Criminal Evidence Act. It's got to be justified, proportionate and reasonable. So if I lock you up now in, West, in North Yorkshire and I've got to transfer you to Birmingham, is that justified and reasonable? Or can I deal with you on a different day? Can I make an appointment before you come into the police station? And it's, we've sat there and it's a beggar's belief. We sit there and brief and we think, what the fuck? And then I've got no excuse because I feel exactly the same. I I I love the police. Like I said, I'll let anyone join the police. But unless I see something that really affects me, I won't ring 999 now because I've seen how it affects them and how much they've got to do and how much the call comes through. So it's got to go through a call taker who's got to put it in the queue. It's got to go through a division who've got to put it in the queue. Then it's got to go to dispatch who then dispatch you. And then there's also someone in a hub, a sergeant inspector thinking, right, we'll get rid of that one, we'll get rid of that one, we'll get rid of it. And you're just driving around a traffic car. Next to Romeo 1 2, go ahead, you can go to this knockdown, yep, I'm aware. So you don't see this, you just get called. And yeah, it fucking, no disrespect, but it pisses me off. You should be able to ring a police officer and they come. For him, that is a massive part of his lifestyle and his crime. And it's really affecting him. It might be the only time in, in, the, in his life when he deals with the police. And now he's got a negative view of the police. And I think that is not how it should be. But then you'll have people, and no disrespect and not about mental health, but you'll have people who have, from a certain estate, that are poor or whatever, and that have, I don't want, I don't know how I categorise this, but they go out in Leeds, they get pissed. And they've got the gyro, go out and get pissed in Leeds. Can't get home, so they'll ring 999. I'm going to sell farm if you don't come pick me up. So you've got a duty of care now. Go pick someone up and take them home so they don't self harm. And this is what I'm on about why it's got too far one way. Policing by consensus, it should be you're a grown adult, fuck off. But can you imagine if they were found then in the back alley with a knife cut, saying she wouldn't police two minutes later, two minutes earlier? And you're sat there behind a the computer desk, now you can fuck off. Are there areas of the UK that are lawless? Very much so. And you've, you can see it on social media. Uh, no excuse for it. Again, it's one of these things. Do you go in and risk everything you've got, all your vehicles you've got? Is is that what it is then? So so, so let's just hypothetically say factory just there behind us, great big factory, loads of forklifts. Let's say, they say a site comes in, let's say a traveller site comes in, um, and there's, let me just say, there's a lot of good, and but a lot of also not good. Um, come in, they steal... 10 forklifts, take them back to a camp with gates. That guy, I know, whoever owns that building, that plant, could be sat here telling me about how the police would not go in there and go and get them. Why? Because you've got to look at different things. There might be firearms markers, um, weapons markers. You might only have two firearms crews on in that area. There might be an armed deployment somewhere. So someone's been shot, shown with a gun. So all firearms got to go there. So you can't have, you've got to have f sub authority, which is for supervision. So the wall, like a Bobby going who's not armed. So you've got to have authority, you might have to have two PSU vans with eight bobbies in the van. There were certain areas of Bradford we wouldn't go without having two PSU vans and probably eight police cars. Then you might only have eight police cars working in Bradford because of the violence you get when you get there. Have you ever looked at somewhere like um, when you, when you could, now that you've got the Chancellor and want to sit back and reflect on all of this, do you ever look at somewhere like Dubai where you can leave a 300 grand watch on a bench is the stigma and it'll be there the next day because so they are so fearful of it being taken and I don't know if this is just um, 
a rumour or whatever. I've never properly looked into it, but if you get caught stealing over there, you just get your hand chopped off. Yeah, I've heard that. So back to what I said about the CPS, the justice system and the courts and the prisons about having an overall. There's no fear for a criminal to go to prison. And when they go to prison, it's like Butlins. They're in with all the mates. They've got pull tables, Xboxes. Though they are. There are, there are a photo, I'll, I'll Google it when we get out of here, there are a photo of lads in Telegraph and Argus who would snuck a phone in and were taking photos of themselves because they're all them with their old mates. So it wasn't a prison sentence. They're getting three meals a day, they're at the gym, they're getting everything they want, they're getting Xboxes, and it's not prison. That is not prison. When you go to prison, you should go because you're punished. And they're saying, well, let him out and go behave you. Well, you should be good when you go to prison. That's the idea of prison. But it's not. It all bends round to the other people. And that's what waste. I'm sat here with you. There's no way you can justify it. It's disgusting. But it's gone too far one way. So if I say to you, bring it back, Ben, am I the wrong person? If I say a prison should be, you should be 23 hours a day locked up, not what to do with your time. Is that me being against people's human rights? Because I've got my own views about what it should be like. But I won't put them on air because you'll probably get cancelled. Well, I think then that is probably a great time to round this off. Um, we've done a we'll great... talk about that off camera. We've had a great episode. Thank you very much for coming on it. I'm very excited. <laughs> He's dropped his lid. <laughs> I'm very excited to see everything that you're doing. I'm also going to put a link in the description to the event that you're doing here um, at the motorist because I'm going to be attending. Mark my words, I will be up. Um, I can't wait to have you on again at some point because I feel like there's a lot more to talk about and I think you should be unbelievably proud of everything that you've um, done. That was really... Really profound. So, Ben. I'll go that way. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been a pleasure. And thank you. Thank you, mate.